Growing up in the city of New Orleans, the only thing I ever wanted to do was get out of New Orleans. And my mentor, Dr. Morris F.X. Jeff Jr., in 1999, said, Calvin, come on, I'm taking you home. I said, what you talking about, Dr. Jeff? I'm already at home. I'm in the seven ward. I'm in the eight ward. I'm in the night ward. He said, no, Calvin, we got to go to Africa. We got to go to Ghana, West Africa, the Gold Coast of Africa, Calvin. I said, why, Dr. Jeff? He said, you see, Calvin, 80% of the Africans that was brought to America as slaves came from the Gold Coast of Africa, the West Coast of Africa. You got to go home to the Gold Coast. And if we're going to prepare our kids for the future, we have to understand that the present is the last name of the past and the first name of the future. So we can't talk about the future without talking about the present, and we can't talk about the future without talking about the past. When we understand our past, we can do what we need to do in our, our present such that we can have a joyful, grateful future. He said, come on, Kelvin, we got to go home. In 1999, he put me on his shoulders, and I got off the plane in Ghana, West Africa. When I got off the plane, what he said, I had a... I had a lineage, I put my feet on the soil, and it was like I was having a spiritual renewal, and I knelt down and I kissed the ground. In Ghana, West Africa, the opportunity to go and visit the Elamina Castle. And the Elamina Castle was the first castle built in sub-Saharan Africa by the Portuguese and the Dutch to trade the dead yellow gold with the living black Africans. But eventually they stopped trading the dead yellow gold that we were killing each other, each other over the day, and they began to trade the living black Africans. An opportunity to go into the room where they used to house the Africans nearly 400 years ago, and still to this date, you can smell a stench of rotting bodies. An opportunity to go and look through the door of no return, such that when an African went through the door, he or she knew that they'd never see their mother, never see their father, never see their homeland again. And ignorantly, I asked. I said, why is this door so narrow? And they said, Calvin, the door is narrow because they used to starve the Africans before they put them on the ships, such that they wouldn't have the strength to fight back. I was overcome by the spirit. And I came outside the castle and I sat on the coast of Accra, overlooking the turbulent waters of the Atlantic Ocean, where they estimate nearly 50 to 75 million Africans had to perish, such that people like ourselves could be here in America doing the things that we're doing. Still to this date, if you study patterns in the Atlantic Ocean, still to this date, the sharks follow the same patterns that the ships took nearly 400 years ago due to the large number of bodies being disposed off the sides of the ship. Young people, I sat there with my head in my hands. I began to think about an adage that was taught to me in the New Orleans public school system when I was growing up. When my teacher said, Calvin, every morning in Africa, a lion awakens and realizes that he must outrun the slowest gazelle or he shall starve. She said, Calvin, also every morning in Africa, a gazelle awakens and realizes that he must outrun the fastest lion or he shall be eaten. She said, Calvin, the moral of the story is when the sun comes up, whether you wake up in Africa, Europe, New Orleans, Nashville, she said, Calvin, when the sun comes up, you better wake up running. <laughs> Young people, you all better wake up running every day because I have a message for you. See why we sitting here doing the soldier boy and the Superman, woo! <laughs> you see why we backing that thing up, stopping it, dropping it like it's hot? You see why we walking that thing out and doing the two-step? I want you to know something. Right now at this moment, there's a little kid in India and a little kid in China studying under the cloak of darkness to a candle, waiting for the opportunity to kick your behind and it's not even personal. It's not even personal. They don't care. They don't care if you're rich, if you're poor, if you're white, if you're black, if you're Asian. They just want the opportunities that we're not taking advantage of in a place called America. We are training you all to go around the world and compete with the world. I came back from the city, from Ghana, West Africa, came back to the city of New Orleans. And I sat down, I was watching the Discovery Channel. And I love the Discovery Channel. Discovery Channel taught me something that blew my mind. Discovery Channel taught me that the lion hates the cheetah. I said, why would the lion have anger in his heart, fear in his heart, hate in his heart towards another animal when God has ordained the lion to have the dominion over the jungle? He's the king, he's the master hunter. Why should he hate on another animal? And Discovery Channel taught me that the lion hates the cheetah because the lion realizes that even though he's the king and he's the master hunter, the lion realizes that if he sees a piece of meat and a cheetah sees the piece of meat at the same time, <laughs> the lion may be the king, but the cheetah can do what? Outrun him to the meat. So, <laughs> so the lion hates the cheetah, but the lion says, all is lost, Mr. Cheetah. You may outrun me to the meat, but I sneak up behind you and the meat and eat both of you all. <laughs> but, the lion, but the cheetah says, oh no, Mr. Lion. He said, not only have I been ordained with superpower speed, I'll run you, Mr. Lion. He said, Mr. Lion, I've been ordained with superpower strength, such that after I'll run you and get the meat, 
I could take myself and my meat and I could climb a tree and perch myself up on a limb where you cannot get us, Mr. Lion. So the lion hates the cheetah. Now, this is what Discovery Channel taught me. If you don't believe me, you go to www.discovery.com. <laughs> got a reference stuff, and this is what it'll teach you. It'll teach you that every morning in Africa when a lion goes out to hunt and he comes across a little bit of cheetah cubs, little baby cheetahs, he kills them, and he doesn't even eat them. He kills them. Now, 100 in Nashville, the moral of the story is this. Kings, the moral of the story is this. From one cheetah cub to the next, from one cheetah cub to the next, we cannot allow the lions in our lives to kill you before, we, before you can grow up and compete. Young men, you all are truly our cheetah cubs. Many of you all have been allowed to study things, read things, t go to schools, sit before computers, and do things that your mothers and your fathers and your ancestors before you have never had the opportunity to do. But you better believe every day in America when you stand up and decide to be better than the rest. When you decide not to be the images that you see on videos. When you decide not to be the thugs that's shown on the news every night. When you decide not to do that, you better believe there will be lines waiting to kill you. And it's our responsibility as men, it's our responsibility as the community, it's our responsibility that 100 black men has taken on to stand in the gap and save our cheetah cubs.